The intent of this presentation is to help you strengthen your understanding of the fundamental principles of neuromodulation. At the end of this video, a short overview of neurostimulator troubleshooting will be conducted. Neurostimulators work by pumping charges out of one electrode and collecting them through another. Without the two electrodes, electrical current would not be able to flow as no complete circuit would exist. One electrode configuration, referred to as the bipolar configuration, utilizes two electrodes at the end of the implanted lead. Again, one electrode pumps out charge from the device while another electrode collects it. Before reviewing impedance and the role it plays in device function, a brief review of basic electronic circuits is called for. Here, you can see a simple circuit. The battery provides power to the load, or resistor, in the circuit. This resistance could be something like a stereo speaker, or it could be a light bulb. However, in the case of neurostimulation, this resistance is in fact the tissues of the body. Applying this basic concept to a neurostimulator, there are three main impedances involved in the system. When assessing the impedance measured by the neurostimulator device, the total of these three impedances are measured together. The first is the lead impedance, or impedance of the wire that connects the implantable pulse generator to the electrodes. This is outlined in blue. This impedance is generally very small in comparison to the other two impedances in the circuit. However, if a lead becomes damaged, this impedance will change drastically, which we will discuss on another slide. The second impedance, and usually the largest, is the electrode impedance, highlighted here in orange. This is the metal tissue interface where charges carried in the wires of the stimulator device are transformed into ions which can then move through the tissues of the body. The third impedance, integral to neurostimulation, is tissue impedance, which as mentioned earlier, is simply the resistance to flow ions encounter as they move through cells and the extracellular space from one neurostimulator electrode to another. Impedances can be helpful in understanding why devices stop functioning. Looking closely at the lead, there are four wires within, one for each electrode at its end. Now, let's assume the device is implanted and functioning normally. As current flows down one wire, it will flow out through the electrode attached to that wire. It then re-enters the lead through another electrode and travels back to the device through the wire attached to that electrode. Normally, the impedances measured for sacral neuromodulators range anywhere from 400 to 1500 ohms. Now, let's examine a device where the wires have crossed. This is referred to technically as a short circuit and can occur if a lead is crushed or subject to other trauma. With a short circuit, current flows down one wire and back through the other, never reaching the electrodes. Thus, neurostimulation therapy often loses efficacy when a short circuit occurs. Impedances measured with short circuits are generally very low, usually 50 ohms or less. Lastly, let's examine a device where a wire has broken. This is technically referred to as an open circuit or break and can occur when a lead is stretched or subject to other trauma. In this situation, stimulation is ineffective as current cannot flow due to the lack of a complete circuit. Impedances with an open circuit are generally very high, often 4,000 ohms or greater. Now, let's consider a case scenario to help reinforce some of this knowledge. Here we have a 67-year-old woman who presents to your office three years after receiving her interstim. She complains of a loss of efficacy and a loss of stimulus sensation in the perineum. The next appropriate step would be to troubleshoot the device and attempt reprogramming. Practically speaking, changing stimulation parameters can change patient sensation with neurostimulation. With sacral neurostimulation, patients report sensations in the perineal region. As the stimulation cycles on and off, patients will be able to tell the device is working and will often describe the feeling as a thumping when the device is set at a low rate. Increasing the amplitude of the stimulus will cause patients to feel a stronger sensation in the perineum, which they may also note to be present in the surrounding areas. This is the result of the excitation of nerve fibers farther away from the electrode due to the increased amplitude of the stimulus signal. Increasing the rate of the stimulus will cause patients to have a change in sensation from a thumping at a low stimulus rate to a fluttering at a higher stimulus rate. The first step in investigating any neurostimulation device should be to check the device for error codes. Assuming none are present, the next step is to check the circuit impedance, which will either be normal or abnormal. If impedance is normal, the stimulus strength can be increased by raising the amplitude or prolonging the pulse width. This may restore patient sensation and solve the problem. 
However, if not, it may be necessary to try a different electrode pair and change the amplitude or pulse width again, repeating the cycle until a reasonable number of combinations of stimulus waveforms and electrode pairs have been exhausted. If this is the case and sensation is still lacking, the device may need to undergo surgical revision. Going back to the initial impedance check, if abnormal impedance is measured, the electrode pair can be changed with the intention of utilizing remaining intact electrodes to successfully provide stimulation. Thus, once a pair of electrodes with normal impedance is selected, the stimulus should be adjusted by varying amplitude and pulse width, and if successful, sensation will be restored and the problem corrected. However, if unsuccessful, a reasonable number of combinations of stimulus waveforms and differing electrode pairs should be evaluated. Following this, if no intact electrode pairs and stimulus combinations have restored sensation, a device revision may be necessary. Now that the basics of impedance, troubleshooting, and device function have been covered, here are a couple clinical scenarios illustrating these points and integrating the concepts. If a patient presents with a loss of sensation in the perineal area, the device is likely not providing sufficient stimulation. If this is due to minor electrode migration or electrode encapsulation by the natural immune response, patient sensation can often be restored by reprogramming the device. These situations are why leads should be implanted using a mid to low range amplitude for localization, such that when minor migration or encapsulation occurs, the amplitude and or pulse width of the device can be increased to compensate. However, if reprogramming fails, the device gives a malfunction message or impedances are abnormal and suggest problems with leads or electrodes, revision of the implant may be necessary. However, prior to surgical revision, troubleshooting of the neurostimulator device should be performed. Thank you.